interesting. All right, welcome to Words with Writers. It's April 4, 2022. I am Kathy Beal, the author of Eat, Drink, and Be Wary. Sorry, Cautionary Tales. And I am here today. Well, actually, my book explores the greater role that food and drink play beyond nutrition, often in very sassy ways. And my guest today takes that exploration into territory that is far outside what I covered. Uh, I am talking today with Debbie Lewis. She holds a BA and an MA in English and Creative Writing from the University of Wisconsin, where she was a recipient of the Eudora Welty Prize for Fiction. Her short fiction and essays have appeared in more than a dozen publications, including the New York Times, Huffington Post, Bon Appetit, and more. Uh, her book, Kitchen Medicine, How I Fed My Daughter Out of Failure to Thrive, tells the story of how Lewis made her way through mothering and feeding a sick child, aided by Lewis's growing confidence in front of the stove. It's about how she eventually saw her role as more than caretaker and fighter for her daughter's health, and how she had to redefine what mothering and feeding looked like once her daughter was well. This is a story of learning to feed a child who can't seem to eat. It's the story of growing love for food, a mirror for people who cook for fuel and those who cook for love. For those who see the miracle in the growing child and in the fresh peach, for matzo ball lovers and the gluten intolerant, and for parents who want to feed their kids without starving their souls. Welcome, Debbie. Thank you for having me. Thrilled to be here. We've been chatting before we went live, and, and there's a lot of stuff that's probably going to go way off what my framework was for our conversation. But I would like to start. Um, I'm assuming that most of the people who are watching this have not yet read your book, which I highly recommend that people do, even if you're not a breeder. It has many things that anybody could resonate with, especially if you yourself have ever been put on a medically restrictive diet and struggled with how in the world you're going to feed yourself. Um, it's clear from the book, Debbie, that food was the dominating force in your family and in your life for years. And I would like to start to focus by focusing on you because the caretaker often gets lost in the shuffle. And this story, this book is very, very much your own story, as well as the story of how your family dealt with your uh, second child. Um, I would like to talk about the evolving relationship of the evolving journey of your relationship with food. Um, now, as I see it, the first big shift happened when you were a teenager and you decided to become a vegetarian. Can you tell us about that? Sure. Um, so I am, uh, my family is Jewish. And when I was in high school, um, my religious school education was pretty open-ended. Uh, just me and the other teens got to sit with the rabbi and chat about anything we wanted. And that was when I learned um, more about keeping kosher. And I had decided at the time that I'd like to try it. But anyone who's tried to um, keep kosher can tell you that kosher meat is very expensive. And when I talked to my parents about keeping kosher, they were absolutely dead set against it. And so my solution was to just be a vegetarian. Um, so I came to it in a really different way than I think a lot of teenagers do. I wasn't at the time so concerned about ethics or morals or hurting the poor baby animals. I just didn't have any other way to keep kosher. Um, but over the years since, um, I've, I've certainly encountered all the rest of the reasons that some people become vegetarian and, um, and feel like that was the right choice, even though it was for a different reason when I started. Um, vegetarian food has come a long way, thank goodness. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, now, you married a man who was, uh, who did eat meat when you first got married, but mm -hmm. even his, uh, he, he has come to it for, uh, for health reasons, correct? Yeah, David is not a vegetarian, but he eats vegetarian at home with us and, you know, probably more than half the time when he's out on his own. Um, he's just you know, got family history of heart disease. And, um, and he's uh, thankfully one of those kind of people that will eat anything and likes lots of things. So he's just as happy to eat the vegetarian food I cook. Um, I, I did cook meat for him a little bit when we were first married, but um, in the end, it just made more sense for him, given that he didn't care that much. Thank goodness. 
So um, what did you see as the next big shift in your relationship with food? In the book, it seems like it happened when you started going to farmers markets. Yeah, I think that's probably true. Although I had to kind of get beyond sort of survival eating after my first daughter was born because I wanted her to have a, you know, a broad palate. And I was kind of a, like a bread and cheese vegetarian, you know, whatever was, uh, you know, all those kinds of fake, fake meats and pasta and grilled cheese sandwiches and that kind of thing. And I, I wanted, you know, I wanted to be a good mom and feed her well. Um, but then, yes, when my younger daughter was born and we started escaping to the farmer's markets on Saturday mornings so that my husband could get a few extra hours of sleep, um, I kind of fell in love with, with the beauty of produce. I mean, if you look at it, it I've occasionally joked that it, we should be giving each other bouquets of like broccoli and Brussels sprouts. Like they're beautiful, tomatoes, all these things, they're so pretty. And um, I got kind of taken with the romance of a farmer's market, for sure, that helped a lot. That and becoming a member of a community supported agriculture program, a CSA, getting mm -hmm. shares of food every week. Um, huge shout out to Angelic Organics Farm in the Chicago area, um, which provided me with a, a cookbook in the first season that took you through the growing season of all the foods and how to prepare them. Hugely educational for me in, in learning how to cook with all kinds of vegetables. And isn't there isn't there a moment of like this is the origin of my food? I mean, I'm, I'm reminded of when I lived in a this is a. a a, an example that will be horrifying to you, but I lived with a, a family in, in Austria for the summer and uh, I met the cow around the corner where our milk came from. I was like, what? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a grocery store fed kid. And one day I came home and there was a plucked chicken whole on the counter. I went, ah! and I realized that's where the food comes from. And there's something about seeing uh, produce that has still been, that's been freshly pulled out of the ground and still has dirt on it. It makes yep. you realize oh, this is so neat and tidy. There's something to this. It's amazing, right? When you think about it, like that this food that we eat, it just comes out of the ground. I mean, in particular, some vegetables grow without almost any human interaction at all. You know, herbs and things like that, that, that they're just there. No packaging, no marketing campaign, you know, no, um, no slick regeneration of molecules. It's just food out of the ground. It's amazing. It's a miracle. And as you uh, went more and more to farmers markets, didn't you also learn about the, the notion of seasonal availability? Yes, I did. Um, I tell this story in the book that with that one year um, before we had kids, my husband and I went to a Passover Seder where um, we were served fresh strawberries on a, a Passover angel food cake. And they were remarkable. Strawberries have always been one of my favorites foods, but I never really knew how to pick them out. And I'd ask somebody, you know, why they were so good. How did you pick these? How did you know these were the good ones? And they said, oh, it's March. You know, this is when strawberries are good. And so that when I went to the farmer's market years later and saw strawberries when they're, when they grow here, which is, you know, sort of end of June, early July and asked, why are they so good now? I thought they grew in March that the farmer said, well, maybe in California, but here, the growing season for strawberries is in March. And that's what a community supported agriculture program really does for you, a CSA. Because as you get a box of vegetables every week from a local farm, if you do it for enough seasons in a row, you start to realize, oh yes, yeah, so everything I get in you know, May and early June is gonna be leafy greens because that's what grows in the cold. And then as it gets warmer, the fruiting crops like you know, peppers and tomatoes, those start coming. And then corn is you know, around the 4th of July. You just start to, realize when things grow and that this is really how we all used to eat before everything came to us in refrigerated trucks from Mexico. I agree completely. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing you talk about that seemed to be another um, turning point moment for you was uh, acquiring family recipes. Yes. So can you That's talk true. about that please? Sure. Um, my favorite family recipe origin story is, of course, my grandmother Dorothy's Kugel. So my father, unfortunately, lost his mother when he was only 12. And his father remarried and his sister um, died fairly young. And so he didn't have any access to his mother's recipes or the foods that he'd eaten as a kid until 
um, I think it was, you know, sometime in the, the mid to late 2000s, an, a cousin found a, a bunch of recipes of his mother's in her mother's drawers when she died and sent them to my dad who scanned them and sent them to me. And we made my grandmother's kugel. Um, for those who don't know, a kugel is a Eastern European Jewish food. It's a noodle casserole. Most of them, at least from my family and from, um, from a lot of families from Eastern Europe are sweet. Um, a luxion kugel is a noodle kugel that is a little bit sweet. And um, so I made this luxion kugel recipe. It has apricot nectar in it, which is a little unusual. Um, and, um, and it was just delicious. It was one of my very favorite things I'd ever made. Um, and it made a difference to me that it had come from my grandmother who I'd never met. Um, and so we actually, uh, my, my older daughter loved this kugel so much that we actually gave the recipe to the caterers and they made it for her, her bat mitzvah luncheon um, because it was so special to us. And, you know, sometimes a recipe is good in its own merits and better if it means something. At least so it links you to something more than your own life. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. And didn't you also start adapting some uh, family recipes? I think there's almost none that I haven't um, because I'm pretty lactose intolerant. Um, and so I really can't eat anything with dairy. And if I'm the cook in the house, I'm going to make it so I can eat it. So um, for that kugel, um, it wasn't too hard. Um, there are really great dairy-free cream cheese analogs now. So I just I used a, a dairy-free cream cheese instead of regular cream cheese. Um, butter for, I could easily swap for um, really good brands now of, of vegan margarines mm -hmm. um, and milk. There's a, a bunch of milk alternatives out there now. So those, reci those recipes got adapted that way. Um, matzo ball soup, which is another, I, it's hard, hardly a recipe. It's a technique or a set of, set of, um, of skills to make matzo ball soup. Um, I've always made vegetarian, but that's easy to do also, just vegetable broth instead of chicken broth. Um, so yeah, I've adapted these to fit the diets that either are re we required or that we chose. And did this help you become an improvisational cook? For sure. I mean, especially even past the family recipes, when mm -hmm. my younger daughter ended up on all of these strange different um, medically prescribed diets, having to cook without different ingredients requires improvisation with almost every meal. Um, at one point she was vegetarian, dairy-free, egg-free, soy-free, nut-free, and wheat-free. Um, so there was almost no recipes that you could follow just as is. There was always some kind of calculation. Okay, we don't have eggs, so can we mix flax meal with water for this one? Or should this one, should we use applesauce instead of the egg? And, this is gluten-free, but I think I have a gluten-free one-to-one flour blend that would work because it doesn't have to be stretched. I mean, there's a hundred calculations you have to make based on what you're substituting and what place that, that ingredient has in the recipe. What is it, what is it trying to do? And early on, you talk about a, uh, a chickpea soup that you just sort of dreamed up. Yeah, oh, I didn't dream it up. I mean, all the all the props in that chickpea soup to Vegetarian Times Magazine, where it mm. appeared, um, and that. But that recipe, um, it's very very simple, and it's one of the first foods that my younger daughter ate with enthusiasm, and so it has a very very dear place in my heart. Um, it's very simple. It's chickpeas broth, um, onions. I think onions and garlic, any kind of green. Um, and um, I think bay leaves, I'm, I'm trying to recall off the top of my head, but it's, it's a very, very simple soup. Um, and at first I was afraid to change anything because I didn't really know how to cook. But over time I thought, oh, I don't know, I don't have parsley right now, but spinach will probably be fine. It's not, eh, it's good. Or I don't, I, don't have, um, I don't have an onion right now, but I do have a few shallots. I'll just substitute those. And that's what, what you, where you get to when you've gotten some experience as a cook is you, you understand the role a food has to play in a recipe and who can sub for that role. Uh, let's see, there are a couple of other um, things that really jumped out at me. Uh, there is a, a, a theme in your book of the role that food plays at celebration. Yes. And, and how you had to adapt things for celebrations for your daughter with ever evolving special needs diet. Yes. Um, 
what you do? There's something about birthday parties coming up with. Oh, yes. So, yes. So um, my daughter was put on that extremely limited diet um, just a month or two before her fifth birthday. And I was determined that there would be a birthday cake. I didn't know how I would do it without dairy, soy, eggs, nuts, or wheat, but I was going to figure something out. And um, I have a, a good friend who owns a bakery. And so I called her and gave her the, the list of limitations and said, how would you make a birthday cake given this list? And her response was, I would not. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, you'd think I would, I would let it go at that point, but I just did not oh. want to. I did not want to. I was not going to have a five-year-old have a cake made of shaved ice with syrup on it which is what a lot of kids on that diet are, are sort of faced with for, for birthdays. Um, and, and it was around that time that a really good friend of mine figured out how to make rice, um, crisp rice treats um, in a safe way because marshmallows were actually fine on that diet. And so all you really needed to do is find a fat source that wasn't, wasn't dairy and a, a rice cereal that didn't have any gluten in it. Um, at the time, Rice Krispies had gluten in it. Um, so uh, once we figured out the, the options for that, it was, I actually thought, I bet I could frost crispy rice treats. I could figure that part out. And um, a huge, huge thank you to my sister-in-law, Sherry, who had been taking cake decorating classes, because once we were able to make a frosting, she was able to help figure out how to pipe a design on the top of these Rice Krispie treats that looked like my daughter's very favorite TV show at the time. Um, and so Always important. Oh, very important for a five-year-old, very important. And so I was able to make what looked like a birthday cake out of crisp rice treats and frosting made with, you know, dairy and soy-free margarine and sugar and food coloring. And um, it felt like a real birthday cake. It felt like a real birthday party. And I just didn't want her to have anything less than that. And you did the same sort of thing with uh the the concept of a seder food is integral to a seder and wasn't there a very special one you improvised for sammy yes so passover which is coming up in now this next week um in in uh in 2014 um sammy was in the hospital recovering from cardiac surgery the week of passover and my husband and i had made plans for him to go to a seder a passover a, tr a ritual passover meal with our older daughter one night while I stayed in the hospital and vice versa the other night. And uh, my younger daughter, Sammy, had overheard us talking about it and asked me, well, what about me for Passover? And we were in the hospital um, and we certainly weren't following the traditional Passover diet, which is, you know, no leavened, no leavened breads. We were, you know, just hoping, hoping she would eat anything at that point. So, um, so I hadn't really thought about it. Um, but yet another wonderful family member to the rescue, um, David's Aunt Maxine, um, brought us a box of matzah and a couple of jars of jam. At that point, Sammy was on a fat-free diet um, because of an injury to one of her thoracic ducts doing, during surgery. So we couldn't have, you know, matzah ball soup is made with eggs and oil and none of that could have been, been done. But, we, but once the, the evening had kind of wound down and things were quiet in the hospital, um, I brought Sammy, I brought my chair over to the side of Sammy's bed and we opened up the matzah and we had matzah with a little bit of fat-free cheese for her and a little bit of jam. And we talked about the story of Passover, which is really one of the main requirements of a, of a Passover Seder is that you tell the story of the Exodus, which we did. Um, and then a nurse popped in and asked what was going on. So we explained it to the nurse too. Um, and then we watched the movie, The Prince of Egypt, which is an animated movie about, about this, the Passover story. And you know, it wasn't a traditional Seder, but we made something happen. Um, and and in, in some ways, I think it was the most meaningful Seder I've ever attended because we really and, got down to exactly what was essential. And making do with what you have. It's true, which is also part of the Passover story. That's kind of what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you're right. And um, and you created a, a memory for your daughter that I expect will uh, be with her forever and ever world without end. I think you're right. Uh, uh, so that gets to, I'm jumping down on my, on my questions here. You developed some of your own traditions with your family and her soup, Sammy's soup is one of them, mm -hmm. the, the chickpea soup. But were there other, other traditions you can think of that you started, that, that you started, that you created for your family? 
Yes. Well, I think, you know, one of the things about marrying into a very, a big local family, my husband's family is almost all in Chicago, is that there were some holidays that were sort of already claimed, um, but nobody was doing Passover and nobody was really doing Hanukkah. And so those were holidays that even before I had kids, I said, we'll, we'll take those, we'll host those holidays. And so they've grown up, you know, kind of always expecting that our house is where those holidays happen for the family. And that means a lot to me. Um, I grew up very far from any extended family. So we were as a, as a foursome when I was a kid, pretty much always on our own for these holidays. Certainly my parents had friends that we saw sometimes, but it wasn't the same. It's not the same as having your grandparents and aunts and uncles and everyone over. Um, and so having big family gatherings was, was something that I that I started for us. Um, but specific foods, one of them is a Passover food. Um, we, we make this Passover stuffing. Um, it's like crumbled, crumbled matzahs with uh, carrots and celery and onions and tons of, of margarine um, wrapped up tight in some tin foil and baked. Um, and we call it matzah stuffing, but we're not stuffing it into anything except these, these rolls. But I've had my girls like sitting on the floor crumbling matzah into bowls since they were, you know, old enough to hold a matzah and crumble it into a bowl. Um, and that's an image that I really love picturing in my head is two little girls surrounding a bowl, making a huge mess and laughing. That's a, that's a big one. Um, we started making sushi uh, together during the, the fat-free diet that Sammy was on. Okay. Um, because uh, we needed a meal that everybody could enjoy that would be easy to adapt for the rest of us who did not need to be eating fat-free. For, for those of people who are watching who don't have a, a full grasp of what fat-free means in a medical context, um, lots of us ate fat-free in the 80s, you know, when that was the, all the rage for diets, but, but there were grams of fat that were allowed on a fat-free diet um, for Sammy and a fat-free diet because of this medical complication, we're talking about half a gram of fat as the absolute upper limit. So that means you can't spray a pan with spray oil to cook your vegetables. You can't have air popped popcorn that has a full gram of fat per serving. So it's really, really limiting. And while as a family, we followed these other diets together when, when we were eating together, we, we, it was, it's not healthy to eat entirely fat-free unless you have to. So sushi became a meal that we could, we could make together that we could each have our own kind of, kind of rolls. So while I made rolls with fat-free cream cheese for Sammy, um, for David and Ronnie, my, you know, my older daughter and my husband, they ate with full fat cream cheese. Mine was dairy-free cream cheese, um, but we could all sit around the same table and eat sort of the same meal together. Um, and we, it's a, if anyone's ever made sushi before, if you're making many, many rolls for a whole family, it really has to be an assembly line. So it's something we worked on all together. Um, and we still do to this day when we make sushi, it's all hands on deck. Some people are working on the, the tamago in the, on the stove and some people are chopping vegetables and some people are rolling and um, it becomes kind of a family event. And it's really fun, actually. I'm very grateful that we stumbled on this. So food in that way operates as a unifying force in your family. Yes, for some meals, for sure. It's, it's, a, it's something we all do together. Uh, going back to family traditions for just a second, you yeah. talk about a trip to Brooklyn and yeah. what that awakened. How did that, what it, tell us about that. Right. So when Sammy was in the hospital for that last surgery, she'd, um, she'd had this fixation for a little while. She was eight years old, but she, was, she had wanted to see the Statue of Liberty in person. So we spent some time distracting her in the hospital with a book on New York for kids, planning a trip there at the end of the next summer. And so um, when we went, I knew that I wanted to tour the Lower East Side of Manhattan, where all the traditional Jewish you know, restaurants and, and businesses had been you know, back in the day, and that some of them are still there. Um, so I insisted that we visit the Tenement Museum, which if for those of you who have never been to New York, is just a wonderful, wonderful experience. Highly um, recommended. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, instead of doing their culinary tour of the Lower East Side, we kind of did our, our own thing. Um, so we visited Russ and Daughters, which is a delicatessen with a wonderful, wonderful history that has, you know, all the things you would think a deli should have, um, you know, bagels and cream cheese and deli meats and lox and Dr. Brown's cream soda and, you know, all of the, 
the, the traditional stuff. Um, and also uh, Yona Schimmel's knishery, um, where you can buy potato knishes. And um, if you've been in there, I don't think they've changed a thing in that in that space for a hundred years. Um, I agree. <laughs> yes, and and thank God because whatever schmutz is covering everything makes those knishes taste delicious. Um, so we did um, we did one afternoon stop at both places and then pick up on a park bench across the street and enjoy all of it. And in addition, the one place I didn't mention is um, the Pickle Guys, which are also in, um, in the Lower East Side, a wonderful shop that sells pickled everything from what I can tell. And we had bought, you know, five or six different kinds of pickled vegetables um, to eat also with our little Eastern European, our Ashkenazi feast. Um, and it was wonderful. Yeah. And I wrote down Brooklyn when it was clearly Lower East Side. I apologize for no, that. No, that's okay. My um, mother grew up in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. um, and so these are the foods that she described from her childhood. You know, she spent every Sunday, her father and mother held a brunch at their house with appetizing, which is what they called it back, back then. Um, all these things, bagels and lox and deli meats and pickles and, you know, all of that good stuff. So I'd been hearing about it my whole life, but um, had never had it. So it was really fun to go do that there. Appetizing is on the neon sign over Russ and Daughters. That's it's right. Call yes. it that. Yeah. And that building is just so beautiful. To me, it looks like the uh, like you're in a 1930s ocean liner or something. It's very unusual architecture on the inside. Yeah. Still there. Yeah, it's, it really was, um, you know, there's something about it that sort of reaches back in several generations and touches the, the people that I've never met and touches the people that you've never met. That's mm -hmm. part of it. So it puts you in a, yeah. a lineage of some, you know, especially for, now, I, I have a similarity in background as you, mm -hmm. uh, my family grew up very, very far away from extended family. Mm -hmm. And there's, there are these, these names and places and things that are um, mythological almost because yes. they, they were brought up and there are these, these things that you can never quite touch and so to go to ground zero where things you heard about uh actually exist is yeah. uh, it's a there's a, a real power to it and it hits you on a level that is not entirely conscious I think yeah I agree I remember my father describing um because I've I'd eaten a knish before and um in front of my parents and have them sit look at it and say it's not really a knish because a real knish should immediately soak through the paper towel that you're holding it in and, <laughs> and make your hands greasy. And that knish is not greasy enough. Um, so being able to eat a real knish that did exactly that, I mean, just soaked in oil and dripping on everything. And that, you know, I, once I tasted it, I knew what he meant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Comes soul food. Yeah, for sure. Um, Switching gears to something possibly, well, definitely not as pleasant. Did food at times feel like a battleground to you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I think I describe it that way a few places in the book because, you know, when, when um, as a parent, I'm, you know, I'm the only one who can feed the kid, right? I'm, I'm, it's not like if I decide I'm going to give up and not bother with this, that she can survive on her own. Um, so I, I did have to figure it out somewhere between a puzzle and a battle, right? Um, you're staring at um, the elimination of two thirds of your normal diet and trying to figure out how to feed someone, not just for one meal, but for every meal for six to eight weeks um, until you can add one of those foods back in. Um, it's daunting um, and scary because the stakes are very high. You know, a little girl, like she needs, she needs lots, of, not just a little bit of food. She, she needs to eat a lot to grow and to keep her brain moving and um, trying to figure out what to make was hard and scary. And it required a lot of research. And I was shocked at how little support there was from the practice that, that you know, prescribed this diet. Uh, they handed me a packet, a, a photocopied packet of meal plans, most of which included meat. And we would have given her meat if that was what was necessary. Like, of course, we would have fed her meat. And we, if I had to eat it too, I would have done it. But they didn't want that because they didn't want to complicate 
the test results by adding in something that she'd never eaten before. So we, we were really left without a lot of direction. Um, thank goodness I didn't have um, a day job. At, well, I mean, I worked for myself, but I didn't have like to leave and go to work in an office every day, all day, because the research and the preparation time was intense. I have never, ever been more aware of my privilege than when we were following this diet. Because it was your job 24 seven, basically, right? Yeah. I mean, there were days where I had my computer and I'm for my, my day job is making websites and I would have my computer on the kitchen counter, half working on a project and half watching whatever thing I was making, which was an ingredient for the thing I would make later. <laughs> you know, it was, mm -hmm. it was a tremendous amount of work. Um, and, and scary, you know, if I'd failed, if you fail, if you're making something for your family for dinner and it burns, well, you could just order takeout or everyone could have, you know, grilled cheese or something. But if I failed, there just, there wasn't much left in the house that we could do fall back on. I mean, mm -hmm. we were limited largely to like tortilla chips and vegan cheese. If I failed, you know, it was a lot. So switching into something much happier, you do okay. mention a couple of special joys uh, in your book, and one of them is soy milk hot chocolate. Uh, yes. What does that represent to you? So I, I, became, I became quite aware of being very lactose intolerant right around 1999 or so. Um, and so I just, you know, I just stopped eating dairy products, but um, there's a lot of the world at that time that, you know, wasn't aware or interested in alternative milks. Now you can go almost anywhere and have your choice of three or four different non, non cow milks, but that was not the case in 1999. And so I spent a lot of time like eating French fries while everyone was having ice cream or, you know, drinking tea while my friends were having cappuccinos. Um, and, and, you know, I put up with it. It wasn't, it's not like this was a, a huge problem. It's a problem of great privilege, right? But, but it was still sad um, and, and frustrating. And, um, and so when Starbucks started offering soy milk in, I think it was about 2004 or so, um, suddenly I could have all the, not maybe not all, but most of the things that everyone else could have at Starbucks. You know, I could have, I could have a cappuccino if I wanted. Um, and when I got pregnant and stopped drinking things with caffeine in them, I could have hot chocolate. And in, in that pregnancy with Sammy, I was queasy a lot of it, a lot of the time. And so if I got a peppermint hot chocolate first thing in the morning, it cut my queasiness and um, it was pretty filling, you know, a giant cup of soy milk basically with chocolate in it. Um, and so it, it, was, it was like, you know, God above sent me this lovely treat. And it meant something to me that, you know, somewhere out there, some board somewhere said, we should start thinking about people who don't drink cow's milk. Um, and so once Sammy was born and I had to leave my job because she was so ill, one of the only little small pleasures I had in my life when I was trying to drive her around so she would take a nap while Ronnie was in preschool was driving to the one Starbucks drive through there was in my area and getting a soy milk hot chocolate, sitting in the parking lot of the preschool, reading my book and drinking my hot chocolate, which to me meant that someone out there somewhere cared about people who couldn't drink cow's milk like me. Um, and in a world where I'd been kind of erased from the equation, I didn't have a job anymore. Doctors were more interested in Sammy than me. You know, I didn't have a lot of friends who didn't have um, jobs. And, uh, and so I was, it was sort of at the, rep it was my friend. That hot chocolate was my best friend. <laughs> it was great. So it was a ritual of, of validation, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think this is what, you know, we've all talked a lot about self-care, but that was really one of the only forms of self-care I had was to get that hot chocolate and read my book. Sounds wonderful to me. It was. The other one that jumped out at me, blueberry muffins. What do blueberry muffins symbolize to you? 
Mm. Well, blueberries in general um, were one of the first foods that Sammy really, really liked as a baby. She tolerated other foods. She put up with us trying to feed her other things, but blueberries she actually was enthusiastic about. Um, and similar to your earlier questions about growing seasons, I'd never really liked blueberries because I found them kind of unpredictable. You know, sometimes you get blueberries and they're very tart and they like kind of crunchy and you feel every seed. And sometimes blueberries are delicious puffy and you know really juicy and very sweet and I didn't know how to tell what I was going to get so I just decided I really didn't like them and it wasn't until my mother-in-law brought us blueberries from a farmer's market when Sammy was a baby and promised me they were going to be good that I realized well, you have to get blueberries when blueberries are good um, so blueberries came to symbolize everything from growing the growing seasons and um, you know and and Sammy's one enthusiasm when it came to food um, to um, part of the, my creativity in the kitchen and being able to figure out how to incorporate them into things with a little bit more you know, calorie content for Sammy. Um, and when I learned to make my first blueberry muffin recipe, another book shout out for other people, The Garden of Vegan Cookbook by Sarah Kramer, um, and I think it's Tanya Barnard, um, is, has this this recipe for something called coffee break muffins, which is really just a very simple, sweet vanilla muffin. And it just occurred to me at one point that I could throw some blueberries into it and maybe Sammy would eat it. Um, over the years, I learned to adapt that muffin recipe in like half a dozen different ways. So I can make them regular sized, I can make them jumbo, I can make mini ones, I can make them gluten-free, I can make them with or without eggs. Um, even though the recipe is vegan, I can tell what ingredients we're supposed to sub in for the egg. And if I don't have them, I just use an egg. Um, I can make them, instead of with blueberries, I can make them with chocolate chips because my older daughter doesn't like blueberry muffins. So these muffins came, you know, this muffin came to be kind of like the, the ur muffin, the, the core muffin in my, <laughs> in my repertoire. Um, and, and we still make them all the time. So that's a, it's, it's a family signature, essentially. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the page in the cookbook where that muffin recipe shows up, it is gross. It is covered with stains <laughs> and little writings. My older daughter did a science project on that muffin um, when she was in fifth grade trying make, to make it with vegan substitutes for eggs and eggs and measuring how puffy it got and what the taste what difference was. So that, that recipe is like very well loved. That's the book version of the Velveteen Rabbit. Yes. It <laughs> Eyes is. missing and like, yeah, that's beautiful. That is yes. beautiful. A um, couple of other things. So if you were to sit back and think about it now, what's, what's your current take on food? It's not just what you eat, right? No, I mean, I food for me is love. You know, when when people um, when people get something that I've made for them, it's because I love them. I've made them something to eat. I love them. I want them to see that I thought about what their needs are, what their what their dietary restrictions are if they have any, but also what they like, what they don't like, um, what they're looking for. Um, so I, I'm one of those people who's pretty regularly signing up to make people a meal when they're sick or when they are in crisis. Um, I love having people over to my house and thinking about what they, what I made last time and did they like it and what would be similar. Um, and I love cooking for my family 90% of the time. I do burn out on it. I for sure burn out on it. Um, and last night we made, um, I, I just didn't want to cook dinner, but I also didn't want to eat cereal. So um, I, we just slapped, I slapped together the world's quickest quesadillas with some sauteed seitan and some onions and called it a day. Um, but I, even that was very good. It was delicious. And um, I wasn't going to just eat cereal. It, it means more to me. It's, it's how I care for the people I love. Uh, and a couple of other just kind of like short subjects here before we wind mm -hmm. up. You were telling me about your pre-launch Instagram feed and <laughs> special kitchen gadgets. Can you describe that? 
Yes. Um, so um, anyone who's written a book knows how crucial pre-orders are to the process. Um, when a book before a book comes out, you know, people can order it, and some of sometimes that there's those numbers do mean something to publishers as far as how how they market it. Also, so I wanted to reward people for pre-ordering. So if they reached out to me and let me know that they pre-ordered my book, um, I dedicated one of my kitchen tools and a little story about it to them on Instagram. Um, so my Instagram is grow the sunshine, if anybody is, um, is looking to follow me. Um, so I went through my kitchen and found tools that I could, could share a little story about. And in some cases that I thought were, were tailored to the people who had pre-ordered, if I knew those people, I didn't know everyone. Um, so as an example, um, I have a, a little Parmesan cheese grater, or I guess you could probably grate anything with it, but in our house, it is pretty much dedicated to Parmesan cheese, which is one of my older daughters, like four food groups. And um, it's shaped like a little, little person with a long, with a skirt. Um, and I bought it while I was um, in Paris with my best friend who met me there from her home in Israel. So it has a little story where I found it, why I bought it, why I was there. Um, so that was one of the tools. Another one is a silicone banana that you can put on the handle of a of a pot and I have a pot or a pan. I have a um, little cast iron skillet that you know the handle gets really hot. So this fits right over it and it looks like a banana and it just makes me laugh. I use it all the time and it makes me laugh every time. So those are some of the kind of quirky tools that we have. They're useful and they're really fun. And you employed creativity to get yet another use out of them with your yes. with your book marketing. I That's love true. hearing these stories. Uh, and the one other topic, just shifting really, really quickly, we were talking briefly before we went live uh, about loving to go to different grocery stores, the appeal of exploring a new store. What to, it, yeah. talk about some of the ones in your you were telling me about you that you have gone to the adventure grocery store for <laughs> yes so uh fresh farms grocery store in niles illinois is about a 20 something minute drive from my house um just has aisle after aisle of you know I, we could call them exotic foods but really they're not exotic to the people who grew up with them but aisles of foods you know of, of ingredients and foods from all over the world um actually especially on these elimination diets getting food from other that from other traditions was really helpful. You know, the number of different varieties of rice in the world besides the white rice we tend to eat, but you know, it, it's remarkable. We tried lots of kinds of rices and other grains from other places. So that grocery store is really fun for that. Um, but our favorite grocery store that's not your traditional, you know, um, and around here it's Jewel or, or Mariano's is um, H Mart, which is a Korean grocery chain. And we have one um, not too far from us called Super H Mart, which is enormous. And um, our, some of our favorite, favorite meals in our house are fresh ramen and sushi. And the ingredients for those are much more easily found at a big, big grocery store, like big Asian grocery store like that. So you can get all kinds of fresh noodles. You can get a million kinds of tofu and vegetables you've never seen anywhere else. Um, and carrots that are like this big around, which is one of my favorite things. So lots of fun at unique grocery stores from other places. And I especially like going to one I have never been to before, particularly if it's a chain I've never been to before, because it, it does something similar to what you've been describing. It shows you that your defaults aren't everybody's defaults. You right. walk in and you see different, different products that are stocked, different ways of grouping the products together. Uh, I just find it fascinating. It's yeah. kind of like traveling to a foreign country without having to have your passport. Exactly. A reminder yeah. that there are other ways to live on this planet than what you do. And so many more things to eat. Yes. <laughs> Why is that not a good thing? It's always uh, is there anything else you want to pass on about food? Any final philosophical words or anything? Well, I think the one thing that I would say is if any, if I've learned anything on all of this journey, it's that food doesn't have moral value. Food is, is what you want to make it. It's, it's fuel, certainly, but it's also a vehicle for creativity and for community and for enjoyment and for wonder. And so um, 
it, if anything, it has killed any connection I have to the moral value of, of food. Um, and I hope it's done that for my kids too. Um, we are living in a society where we are constantly being told some new thing that should be bad about what we're eating. And if you just keep trying new interesting things, you're doing fine. Just eat food, just eat, just enjoy, find food that you like, eat it, move, move on or dig deep and get really into it. But, um, but if that, if there's anything I've learned, it's, it's that this, this time on earth is short. Enjoy, have dessert. I'm with you, <laughs> with you on that completely. Uh, well, thank you so much, Debbie. Can you tell people where they can find you and your book? Sure. Well, here is the book, um, Kitchen Medicine, How I Fed My Daughter Out of Failure to Thrive. Um, it is available anywhere you want to order books. I always want people to go to their local independent bookstore and order it from them if they can. Um, but if not, it's on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and bookshop.org and all those good places. You can find me at debbielewis.com, D-E-B-I. Lewis.com um, or on Twitter and Instagram at Grow the Sunshine. Wonderful. Well, thank you very, very much. I enjoyed your book tremendously. It's very powerful writing, and I highly, highly recommend it to anybody and everybody who is watching this or at all. So thank you very, very much, and good eating to you. Yes. Thank you, Kathy.